Hello guys and welcome to part 2 of my DIY milling machine project, where I'm going to show you how I built my milling machine from scratch. In part 1 I built a column, but this part is focused just on the spindle. I originally wanted to add in the belt drive as well, but the video was getting too long. Let's get started then. When you look at the spindle, there are a few things to consider. Spindles for machine tools typically use tapered roller bearings or angular contact bearings. The benefit of angular contact bearings is that you can buy shielded versions of them. In fact, that's why I chose them over tapered roller bearings, because I saved myself the trouble of building a lubrication system for them. Shielded bearings come already filled with the perfect amount of grease. That aside, both of these bearing types have a lot in common. They utilize angled raceways on the inner and the outer ring. That means if you apply radial load on the bearing, it will result in axial load as well, due to the pressure angle. The same applies in reverse. Typically, these bearings are used in mirrored pairs, either in an X or an O arrangement. I chose an O arrangement, so I was able to adjust the axial play of the spindle by preloading the bearing pack via the shaft nut. In terms of parts, we also have the spindle shaft with MK3 taper, a spacer that prevents over tightening of the bearings and the housing. Let's do some chips then. The first part I made was the spindle shaft. As raw material I used a piece of 40mm chromoly steel. I started by putting it into the chuck and making sure that it runs as true as possible. Then I cut two center holes. I did that so I was able to hold the part between centers. After that I started to cut out the rough shape of the part followed by making the bearing seats and the thread. As you can see I had to flip the part around during machining. Turning between centers makes that easy because you don't have to worry about runout. The part will always be centered on the spindle axis. And just like that, the outer side of the part was done. The thing that's missing now is a through hole and the MK3 taper. To achieve that I bought an extra long 4mm drill bit. Here's a regular one for comparison. But since even this drill bit is too short, I also had to flip the part again. To start drilling, I mounted the steady rest, made sure that the part is running true and pre-drilled it with my regular 4mm drill bit. Then I started to use the long boy. Since drawbars for MK3 taper tooling usually have an M12 thread, I drilled that part out until I got a 13mm through hole. Let's talk about one of the trickier things in this build. How to get your top slide adjusted to cut an accurate MK3 taper. Luckily my lathe got an MK3 taper in its spindle. I got a trick from a YouTuber called Bill T. I will link his video into the description. But basically what you have to do is to get the dial indicator like the one I'm using right here, mount it on center height into your tool holder and adjust your top slide until you get zero or near to zero indicator movement when operating the slide. That way you can be sure that the angle is set perfect. And now it's time to cut the taper. As you can see it didn't work out too bad. The indicator shows a maximum runout of around 3 hundredths of a millimeter, measured on the center of my lathe. 
Next up I started to make the spindle housing. It consists of a construction steel piece with a diameter of 100 mm. By the way, don't do what I did in this clip. It doesn't work. On a small lathe like mine, it is hard to work on big and heavy workpieces like this one. You gotta get creative with work holding. That's why I built a steady rest for such parts. But in order for a steady to work correctly, it is important that the contact area between the part and the steady is smooth. That's what I was trying to do in the clip you saw before. The solution for me was to mount it on the faceplate with a 3D printed centering jig. I used an M16 all thread to tighten it through the spindle bore. It's still a weird setup, but as you can see, it works. Now it was time to mount the steady rest, and well, it runs flawlessly. After facing both sides, I started cutting the bearing seats and enlarging the pre-drilled hole. But I did not bring the bearing seats to final dimension yet, because I need to turn that housing into a T-shape with my welder. That T serves as my mounting point onto the mill's arm. Welding isn't too good for precision parts, because you introduce stress onto the workpiece. This can result into over bearing seats or warped parts. That means the final passes will happen after welding. That's the piece of pipe that will be welded onto the housing like that. But it needs the right curvature. For that I 3D printed this jig that fits very tight over the pipe. I used it to grind and cut out the exact curve I need. Well, time for welding then. After welding and some grinding, the head looked like that. Let's head back to the lathe. Once I was finished dialing it in, I brought the bearing seats to dimension. But how am I going to machine the inner diameter of the pipe I just welded onto the head? Well, I got a solution for that as well. As a guide, I 3D printed a disc and mounted it into the headstock. Then I switched to the faceplate and used some flat steel and four pieces of all thread to clamp my workpiece down. After that I just tried to get the axis of the pipe on the center line. The best runout I got was about half a millimeter, but since I had to increase the inner diameter of the pipe by 2 millimeters, the part turned out fine. Or in other words, 
The spindle axis and the pipe axis are perpendicular to each other. Here is how I check the perpendicularity of the two axes. I just fixed two squares on the machine surfaces and measured the distance between them on three points. I measured a failure of about 5 hundredths of a millimeter, which is good enough for me. Next up I made this jig to achieve a nice 5 hole pattern for the bearing covers. A 3D printer is just such a useful tool to have. It makes jobs like that so much easier. I proceeded by drilling the holes and cutting some threads. After that I made the two bearing covers. As the next step I press fitted the arm to the head of the mill. For that I left the arm in the fridge overnight. The head was baked for 15 minutes at 200 degrees celsius. Well I had to bring it in with a sledgehammer anyway. I really expected that to be easier, but in the end I got the shaft all the way in. The only thing left to do now is to assemble the spindle. I started by putting the bearings into the head with gentle hammer blows. To make things a bit easier, I made sure to apply a light film of oil onto the bearing seats as well as the outer ring of the bearings. After the bearings and the spacer were installed, I painted the head and the bearing caps. I was worried about scratching the paint. That's why I put in the bearings beforehand. Then I proceeded to put in the spindle shaft, again with just light hits by a rubber hammer. Now it was time to tighten the shaft nut. I made two tools for that. A hook wrench to grab the spindle shaft and this weird looking thing. As you can see the second one failed very fast, I mean what was I thinking? It was obviously way too fragile. Then I checked the axial play which was still very much. That showed me that I needed to tighten the nut even more. I used the punch for that. Already looks much better now. I tightened the nut until I got next to zero indicator movement. As the last step I just mounted the second bearing cap. Does look pretty acceptable if you ask me. Well, that completes part 2. Originally I wanted to show the belt drive in this video as well, but let's save that as the topic for part 3. Let me know if you liked it and thanks a lot for watching.